Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 190, What is the Trinity? A Triad of Book Reviews. In this episode of the Trinity's podcast, I'm going to review three different short books, and these books all have the same title, What is the Trinity? When I picked that title for my own book, I decided to search Amazon and see if there were other books with that title already out there, and I found that there were three, or really two. I bought all three of them and read all three of them, but one of them is literally just a little kind of Sunday school pamphlet with, you know, a three-leaf clover in it and a crossword puzzle. And it doesn't make any sense, but I'm not going to talk about that. It's not a real book for adults. The other two books I found interesting, and I think problematic in some interesting ways. In general, I'm very disturbed about the information, or rather misinformation, that's out there about this topic. There's a lot of what you could just call common lore about the Trinity that gets passed around, especially by contemporary apologists on this topic of the Trinity. I could give many, many examples of this, but I'll just cut right to the chase. The biggest false assumptions that apologists out there are making about the Trinity are that all Christians have always been Trinitarians, that is, that all Christians have always believed in the tripersonal God that we see in some of the classic creeds. And they also assume that the standard creedal formulas about the Trinity that were made in the 4th century, or modern-day simplifications of those, such as that God is three persons in one essence, they assume that these have always been understood to mean some one thing, Actually, there's not only one theology here, but there are several mutually exclusive theologies, all intended to follow the traditions of the so-called ecumenical councils. Well, I think you deserve better than just common lore, inaccurate claims, and historical misunderstandings that get passed around endlessly back and forth. You deserve to have the best scholarly information presented in an understandable way, whether that's historical, philosophical, or biblical information. My book, What is the Trinity?, is based on cutting-edge work in history and in analytic theology. You'll see me citing current work as well as a number of ancient primary sources. You won't see me presenting my own speculations on the subject as if those are what the mainstream traditions have always said. I try to stick with indisputable distinctions and facts, although I do sort and categorize different approaches to the Trinity, and I analyze different things that people mean by saying that this subject is a holy mystery. But before I get into my book, The Competition. The first is a little book, or rather large pamphlet, called What is the Trinity? It's written by the famous Reformed apologist, Dr. R.C. Sproul, who's the founder and chairman of Legionnaire Ministries, who's also chancellor of Reformation Bible College. He's written more than 90 books, although, as I'll suggest, this isn't one of them. It's small. It's 63 pages, and they're small pages. A number of things about it lead me to think that Dr. Sproul did not produce this pamphlet, It seems to be a couple of short Sunday school talks, which someone else has edited together to form this little book or long pamphlet. I say it must have been somebody else because it's riddled with mistakes that I don't think a PhD would make. Sometimes these mistakes are small, sometimes they're large. They seem to me like mistakes that a student would make or somebody that works for his church or something like that. There's nothing wrong, of course, with recycling your own material. It's just I don't think enough work went into this book. And I'll cite what some of those inaccuracies are momentarily. One point he leads with and emphasizes, rightly, I think, is that the Trinity is not supposed to be a contradiction. Whatever is actually self-contradictory is obviously false. We all know that all genuine contradictions are false. The Trinity is not supposed to be that. You're supposed to say that God is three of one thing, 
and one of something else. Not that he's three of one thing and also not three of one thing because he's one of that same thing. So the Trinity shouldn't be saying P and not P. It shouldn't be implying or asserting any contradiction. Well, sure, I've called this the standard opening move. I don't really think it helps very much to understanding the Trinity or getting past objections to the Trinity, as I explain in a long blog post, which is called the standard opening move. I'll put a link to that on the blog post for this episode if you want to read it. Okay, so it's not supposed to be a contradiction. There are, it can be argued, some ways of understanding the Trinity that are not consistent, but generally I would say that they are consistent, that is, the thing is consistent with itself. So, great, what is this then that is not contradictory? He starts off with a kind of easy breezy survey of some standard terminology about religions. He says, I think accurately that even the earliest biblical writers are monotheists. I would add, though, that we should distinguish monotheism from monolatry. Monotheism is belief in a necessarily unique God. Monolatry is worship of only one being. And you can be a monolater and yet believe that there are many deities. And you can be a monotheist and yet think that you're stuck with worshiping lower down deities or angels most of the time. And there are a number of cultures like this, as has been discussed by anthropologists and specialists in religious studies. I talk about this distinction between monotheism and monolatry in a 2016 paper of mine that was published. It's called On Counting Gods. And there was also an episode of the Trinity's podcast in which I presented pretty much that same material. That's Trinity's podcast 164, also called On Counting Gods. Interestingly, Dr. Sproul does mention cultures like this that have a unique God, a high God, and yet think that most of the time they have to worship some lesser deity. But he still doesn't make this important distinction between monotheism and monolatry. It is true, of course, that Jewish monotheism is also supposed to require monolatry. Whether the Christian form does is another thing. In this part, he says, I think mistakenly, that the Israelites always thought the alleged deities of the surrounding nations were mere idols. In other words, that those deities are just purely fictions. I think that's wrong. I think the authors think they're real and that Yahweh is humiliating them. This is well argued by many scholars. One place you can look is Dr. Gregory Boyd's book called God at War. But it's a side point in a book about the Trinity. The main point is Yahweh is supposed to be the one true God. He's supposed to be, in some sense, the only God. And so even if these gods of the nations are real, if they're demons, rebellious spirits, they still wouldn't be additional gods. They wouldn't have the same status as Yahweh. In his second chapter, he gives a rather offhand version of the claim that the Trinity solves the problem of the one and the many. This is a reoccurring little riff. I don't know who started this, although I suspect it was a 20th century reformed person. I last talked about this in podcast 51 when I discussed the statements of Dr. Ravi Zacharias on the Trinity. Very often, people who give this type of argument are none too clear about what the problem is which the Trinity supposedly solves. Here's the payoff according to Dr. Sproul. The Greek philosophers sought to find the source of both unity and diversity in a coherent way. In my opinion, they never succeeded. But in the Christian faith, all diversity finds its ultimate unity in God himself, and it is significant that even in God's own being we find both unity and diversity. In fact, in him we find the ultimate ground for unity and diversity. In him we find one being in three persons." Well, again, I'm not too clear about what the problem is, but whatever the thing is we're trying to explain, this talk of unity and diversity, why would you think that there would have to be both unity and diversity in the explainer? Why does the explainer have to have unity and diversity within itself in order to explain the unity and diversity in the creation? I have no idea. What if you believe in a unipersonal God and you just say, yeah, but God willed to create various different things. 
and have them be in one coherent orderly system. All right, there's your unity and diversity. There's diversity because God decided to make many things. There's a type of unity because they function together under one set of laws of nature. What do you need the Trinity for? Yeah, nobody seems to know. For his part, Dr. Sproul doesn't tell us. And what are we doing with this argument? We just referenced ancient Greek philosophy, but this isn't why the Trinity was formulated, right? It wasn't that the Christians said, oh, the Greeks, they have this big unsolved problem they've left on the table. Well, it's up to us to solve it. Here, Trinity, that solves the problem, right? No, that's not what happened. So it looks like it's an after-the-fact philosophical justification for a theology which was formulated for entirely different reasons, trying to maybe provide support. Okay, but is this necessary? And does it even work? Completely unclear. When the Trinity's podcast returns, a problem with Dr. Sproul's treatment of a famous messianic prophecy in the Psalms. Moving on, he urges unconvincingly that the Old Testament hints at some sort of multiplicity in God. And he makes an important mistake, I think, about Psalm 110.1, this verse which is so often quoted or referred to in the New Testament as a prophecy about Jesus' exaltation by God. What Psalm 110.1 says is, Yahweh says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Dr. Sproul argues that the word Lord here in the phrase my Lord is the word Adonai, which is a title of God. Well, this is just a very careless argument because there are some indisputable facts that stand in its way. One fact is that this seems to have originally been a coronation psalm. So Yahweh is exalting the human king, perhaps David, to his throne. So no one can say that this term Lord only applies to divine beings or only applies to God. That's not right because in its original context, apart from its messianic meaning, the Lord that's getting exalted is a human king. But there are a couple of other linguistic complications that really inhibit this kind of argument from being made. One of these is discussed at great length by Sir Anthony Buzzard in his book called Jesus Was Not a Trinitarian, A Call to Return to the Creed of Jesus. He's got more than two dozen pages about this. One basic point is that in the Hebrew Masoretic text, in which the vowel points are inserted into the consonants, it doesn't say Adonai, it says Adoni. And Adoni is typically, and I think always used, for human lords, for human masters, and not for God. Now, the Masoretic text was put together in the Middle Ages, and it could be that uh, this is a Jewish reaction against Christian claims about Christ and so on. But even if that's wrong to put the vowel pointings so as to say Adoni and not Adonai, still we have the fact that the whole expression is my Lord. And Sir Anthony Buzzard quotes from an evangelical scholar named Herbert Bateman in an article called Psalm 110.1 in the New Testament, which is in Bibliotheca Sacra 149, 1992. And Bateman says this, The form, Ladoni, to my Lord, is never used elsewhere in the Old Testament as a divine reference. The Masoretic pointing distinguishes divine references, Adonai, from human references, Adoni, Furthermore, when my Lord and Lord, that is Yahweh, are used in the same sentence as in Psalm 110.1, my Lord always refers to an earthly Lord, 
Thus, the phrase, My Lord, Eladoni, apparently indicates that David was directing this oracle from Yahweh to a human Lord, not to the divine messianic Lord, nor to himself. Buzzard comments, Bateman mentions that some think David was speaking to himself, but Bateman prefers a reference to Solomon on the basis that the Hebrew title is Adoni and cannot therefore be a divine Lord. So again, to say that the word is Adonai and that it's just unequivocally a divine title is just not right. You could think that Christ is divine and say that this text has another meaning which the author did not understand, and that refers to the divine Christ. But anyway, just as far as the words are concerned, no, it doesn't say what Dr. Sproul says it says. In other words, the second use of Lord in our English translation, in the original, it's not a word that could only be applied to God or to a divine person or to a divine being or anything like that. In sum, there's no reason to think that this is a hint at divine multiplicity, as there's no reason to take the second occurrence of Lord, my Lord, here, to be a title which only God can have. Quite to the contrary. Okay, but let's lay aside this vague talk about hinting. Where does the Bible actually teach the Trinity outright? Dr. Sproul gives us just five short pages on this. And it's really not much of a case. There are many free sources on the internet which expend much more energy trying to show that the Bible implies the Trinity. Citing just a few passages, he only asserts that the New Testament implies that the Son and Spirit are divine in exactly the same sense that the Father is divine. A heading in the book, I assume introduced by the editor or the person who turned this into a book, a heading says that the Trinity is clearly affirmed in the Bible. But as I show in my book, a number of famous, influential, mainstream Christians in the first three centuries did not believe in the equal divinity of the three. My point is, what's clearly implied by the Bible is clearly affirmed by people who are competent Bible readers and are trying to base their beliefs on it. And you don't see this until the latter couple decades of the 300s, so the end of the 4th century, basically. An interesting fact. Disturbing? Yes. I discuss this in a couple of different chapters in my book, and I quote from original sources and from leading historians that are talking about these things. Okay, so he says the Bible obviously implies the Trinity, but at this point we're still wondering just what the Trinity is supposed to be, if it's just the equal divinity of three different divine persons, well, that just sounds like tritheism. So what are we supposed to think? Well, he doesn't tell us right away. He leaves us in suspense. In this third chapter, he gives a very quick overview of the historical disputes among mainstream Christians in the first five Christian centuries. I hate to say it, but this part is riddled with errors, and this is why I'm sure that Dr. Sproul did not compile this little book himself. I think the compiler probably misunderstood a few things that he said. He gives a quick and I think unclear summary of what theologians call ancient modalism, and then he immediately says this, These views prompted the first of the ecumenical councils the Council of Nicaea, which met in A.D. 325. No. Modalism was part of what was going on, yes. But the immediate stimulus, as everyone knows, is this presbyter from Alexandria named Arius. And he wasn't at all a modalist. He was what you could call a subordinationist about the Father and the Logos. And he got into a fight with his bishop, Bishop Alexander of Alexandria. And this dispute eventually led to the emperor convene a council to try to work it out. I tell the actual story, albeit all too briefly, but I hope accurately, in chapter 5 of my book, with references to some of the best recent historical books and articles on the subject. Another place where you can get accurate information about this controversy and the 325 council that resulted are Trinity's podcast episodes 29, 30, and 31. But the mistakes keep coming. In 325, he says, 
The idea was put forth that God, though three in person, is one in essence. Now, this absolutely did not happen at Nicaea in 325, as I discuss in my book. What he just said, that is, teaching a God who's in some sense composed of three persons which share an essence, that was actually first affirmed in 381. And I describe how that went down. It's actually kind of disturbing how it went down. And it went down after decades of controversy about the 325 statements. So 325 just wasn't about the Trinity, properly speaking, at all. It was not a dispute about the tripersonal God. It was a dispute about the Father and the Logos, and whether the Logos is equally divine with the Father and whether the Logos is also eternal like the Father. It's very perfunctory in what it says about the Holy Spirit, and Christians were still saying a lot of different things about the Holy Spirit, and there's just no mention of a tripersonal God in the 325 Creed. However, when that Creed was slightly revised and reaffirmed in 381, I think it was meant to be Trinitarian at that point, although you have to read it very carefully to see how that could be so. It's not still explicit but I think it's implicitly Trinitarian. In other words, the 381 Creed is meant to imply a tripersonal God. On the next page, another whopper of an error. And I hope this isn't due to Dr. Sproul. I hope this was introduced by his editor or editors. He says, Throughout the ages, the church has said that God is one in essence, being, or nature, and three in person. Throughout the ages... Okay, well, that makes it sound like this is something that Christians have always said. Now, if you study the history before, during, and after Nicaea in 325, you'll see that the big deal there was that they introduced new language when they said the Father and Son are one usia, one essence or substance. People said, wait, what did you just do? That term has never been used before. And they fought pretty viciously over what that term meant or whether that term should be removed from the creed. So they tried to replace it numerous times in the middle of the 300s. They did replace it numerous times. But then in the end, the emperor decided that Nicaea was going to be reaffirmed and revised. Like I said, that happened in 380 and 381. I don't talk about all of these in-between councils in my book because I'm trying to get to the gist of the matter. But I do discuss them at great length in Trinity's podcasts, episodes 169 through 177. Again, he suggests that the meeting in 325 put an end to monarchianism, or what theologians now call modalism. Not true. I discuss this in Trinity's podcast episodes 175 and 176 which are on, at the time, important bishops called Marcellus and Photinus. Both of them hold to certain type of monarchian or modalist theology, as opposed to the subordinationist kind, and uh, they were roundly denounced, but this was years after Nicaea. In fact, as I explain in my book, and I cite the sources on this, the 325 Creed was widely suspected by its opponents of being monarchian or modalist itself. So it's just so far from being true that that creed got rid of modalism once and for all. To the contrary, it was accused constantly of modalism, and only after that issue was kind of satisfied in people's minds after a great length of time was there able to form a coalition around it that wanted to reaffirm it. Now, people, these are not little mistakes. There are little mistakes. I'm not mentioning them. These are big mistakes. These are mistakes that would not be acceptable in a paper by a college student for a class. They should not be in this pamphlet. Then he gives us 12 pages of very loose discussion about the ancient creedal claims that Jesus is one person with two natures. Wait, I thought this was a book about the Trinity. Why are we just going to focus on this now? And we haven't even yet really made clear what the Trinity is. My book explains, chapter 4, that these are two different subjects, the deity of Christ and the Trinity 
They're interestingly related, but we shouldn't confuse the one with the other. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Dr. Sproul gives his interpretation of the traditional Trinitarian formulas. Chapter 4, again, there are mistakes in this section. I'm going to pass them by. In chapter 4, he returns to the Trinity. He's going to finally say what he thinks the Trinity really amounts to, which the reader is really kind of wondering at this point. Bottom line, he's what I call a one-self Trinitarian. He thinks that the so-called persons of the Trinity are not really selves, but rather they're personae. They're like personalities or He doesn't use the word, but you could say modes, ways God is. He says, So the early church came to see God as one being with three personae, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, well, that's that's one take on it. That's what I call a one-self trinity. Talking about the early church here is misleading. He's really talking about what's happening in the 300s. He asserts the traditional view that God is utterly changeless, he's timeless, he's incapable of changing in any way at all. Check out Trinity's podcast 141 and 142 if you want to hear a different perspective on this. This is the two parts of my interview with a young Reformed analytic theologian who's very brilliant and has written an excellent book on this issue of divine timelessness, and he disagrees with Dr. Sproul about this. He maybe realizes that he hasn't said enough about this idea of person, about what the term person means and saying that God is three persons. And so he says some more things, but he just spins his wheels, I think. He says that there are three subsistences. He says they stand under God's essence. I'm not sure what that means, that they're part of God's essence. That would be denied by traditional believers in divine simplicity They all have the essence. He says, the distinctions are real, but they're not essential. They don't disturb the essence of God. He says, he is one essence, three subsistences. That is about as close as we can get to articulating the historic doctrine of the Trinity. Well, wow. That's a dark subject then, isn't it? Last chapter, he considers objections. He only considers really lame objections. One is the Trinity is obviously contradictory, obviously incoherent. Well, no, of course, it's not obviously incoherent, but it's really not too clear what he thinks it is. But if it's one self with three personalities, well, there's nothing seemingly contradictory about that. He seems to really give up on clarifying the terms being and person in the traditional formulas. He says... There is a sense in which God is one and another sense in which he is three. We must be careful to point out that those two senses are not the same. If they were the same, we would be espousing a contradiction unworthy of our faith. But they are different. And so the doctrine of the Trinity is not a contradiction, but a mystery. For we cannot fully understand how one God can exist in three persons fully understand. Well, I mean, of course, nobody who believes in the monotheistic God thinks you can fully understand God, but what does that have to do with this doctrine? Sounds like what he thinks we can't understand is just the doctrine itself. His other objections are that the word Trinity doesn't occur in the Bible. Well, yeah, but by itself, that doesn't really sink the ship. I mean, Maybe the idea of it or the concept is there. Well, is it? He says, oh yeah, obviously it's there. The concept is there. Okay, well, why is it that nobody then is teaching this until the late 300s, if it's just obviously there? Okay, so we don't really know what these two terms mean. We say that God is three persons. We know what the term person means. 
We say that it's in one being or essence. We don't really know what that means. We just stipulate, well, we don't mean the same thing both times. Great. You know, inconsistently with this, he did explain that the persons are personae and that the being just is an individual being. Seemingly, that's what he said. But now he's kind of taking all that back. We don't seem to really understand it. As he closes, he says that the term, although it can't be understood, is useful as a shibboleth, as a term which will be happily pronounced, which will be nodded at by the right people, and which the heretics won't like. And so this will help us to separate the good Christians from the heretics. The heretics won't like this term trinity, and the Christians will like it. Wow. Coincidentally, I start my chapter two by talking about shibboleths, and I say, well, hasn't the Trinity always been supposed to be more than a shibboleth? Isn't it supposed to be an important foundational truth or set of truths which we're to base our lives and base our worship on? It's not just a word, right, that we use to separate friend from foe. He seems to say in the end, well, yeah, actually that is what it is, and that's a good thing. He says, The church should not hesitate to use certain words as shibboleths to force people to reveal where they stand on various issues. And he gives the example of the word inerrancy, which has recently been focused on in American evangelicalism. He ends by just insisting that the Trinity is a perfectly good and useful word, and you're left wondering whether he's actually said what it's supposed to mean or not. Not a good book or pamphlet. It's slapdash. It's inaccurate. It's incomplete. It's unclear. It skips all the hard objections, which are biblical, historical, theological, and philosophical objections. He just sticks with like the ultra surface objections that like a person might think of the first time they thought of this. He gives exactly one reference, one footnote, which is to Calvin's Institutes. In contrast, my book has 155 footnotes in the paperback or endnotes in the ebook, which give both popular sources and scholarly sources, primary and secondary. There are, I would say, three virtues of this book by R.C. Sproul. What is the Trinity? It is cheap. In fact, I think the ebook is free online. It's short. And it does at least introduce a lot of standard terminology, such as modalism, trinity, essence. But that's about the best I could say for it. It's really outdone by any number of free internet resources. When the Trinity's podcast returns, a different book called What is the Trinity? by a seminary professor. The author of the second book called What is the Trinity is named Dr. David F. Wells. It's from a series called Basics of the Faith. Dr. Wells is Distinguished Senior Research Professor at the Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. So again, this is a Reformed production. It's from Reformed Christians in North America, just like the first book. This book has normal size pages, but there are only 38 pages. So it's basically like one chapter, which has nine endnotes. And uh, it's probably got a similar number of words uh, to Dr. Sproul's book. Dr. Wells starts off with a rhetorical point, which is sometimes emphasized by apologists, that surely, surely the Trinity is just too strange to have been intentionally fabricated. Who would have made up something like this, something this confusing? Well, okay, but who's out there saying that it was intentionally made up, that this was lied into existence? (laughs) That's not what Unitarian Christians think. They think that small c Catholic tradition sort of evolved in certain directions and added one thing to another and eventually ended up with a trinity, but they don't think there was just outright fraud and deception. 
going on, at least not initially. They think it's a mistake, of course. He says, this is the central belief. You can't be a Christian without believing this. Yet, somewhat surprisingly, it's not in any one verse, and it's really not even in any one passage of the Bible. He says, the teaching that God is triune has to be constructed from many passages. That's right. So, that's good and honest. It's a little disturbing that right on the first page he uses the term centers of self-consciousness. And that term, which isn't in any of the ancient sources or even in the classical Reformed confessions from the early modern era, that's a hint of the direction that he's going with this book. When does he think the Trinity was revealed? He makes pretty clear throughout the book that it was in the first century. He says repeatedly that the incarnation of Christ or the whole event of his life, death, resurrection, that whole thing, first century, boom, made the Trinity clear or at least made it inevitable. Okay, well, it took quite a while for it to actually play out then. That's actually kind of surprising. If the New Testament's clearly implying it, why do we only see it really formulated in 381? Okay, but he disagrees about that. Like Dr. Sproul, he says, Early in the life of the church, God's triune nature was condensed into several brief creedal statements. Early? Look, 325 is not early in the life of the church. We're not living in early America right now, and they weren't early Christians in the 4th century. The church had evolved in a bunch of interesting ways. One of the most obvious would be the one-bishop system, but of course it goes way beyond that. Again, like Dr. Sproul, he dates the formulation of the Trinity to 325. That's a mistake. I show this in my book. I note the things that they say and did not say. I summarize the argument that led up to it. Nope, that's not where the Trinity comes from. In the popular imagination, that's been fastened upon as kind of a turning point, but not as far as belief in a tripersonal God, not really. Dr. Wells correctly observes that the majority report since the 4th century, although the late 4th century, the majority report has been that God is tripersonal. That's absolutely correct, and I explain how that got to be a majority view in my chapter in my book. He doesn't do that. He doesn't tell the story about what happened just before and at the 381 Council. Dr. Wells describes Old Testament and New Testament monotheism accurately enough, although he clearly mishandles Ephesians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Here's what that famous passage says. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who was above all and through all and in all. Dr. Wells says on this only, there is one Lord and... One God and Father of all. Well, that makes it sound like they're calling one and the same being, both Lord and the one God and Father of all. But of course, that's not so. The one God and Father of all is one being, and another being is the one Lord. Well, that's the man Jesus. That's this New New Testament usage of the term in Greek, hakurios, the Lord, which is really based on Psalm 110.1, not in Hebrew, but in the Greek version that they were using. So the one Lord is someone in addition to the one God, and this is the one Lord Jesus. I talk about this usage of the word Lord in the New Testament in podcasts 14 through 16. He also just mentions and runs way too quickly past 1 Corinthians 8. Like Dr. Sproul, he asserts that the Old Testament repeatedly hints that God is multipersonal, but he ignores less problematic rival interpretations. So when God says us in Genesis 1 and in Genesis 3, a lot of interpreters, a lot of Trinitarian interpreters, think that God is just addressing his heavenly court here. It's not supposed to be a hint of multiplicity within God at all. At least that's how they read it. You wouldn't know this reading this book. 
Okay, so what is the Trinity that's so central to Christianity, that's so clearly taught by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus? Initially, he sounds a lot like R.C. Sproul. He talks about, quote, one God who in his being is tripersonal, end quote. Note the personal pronouns, who, his. It sounds like he thinks the Trinity is really a single self. But then you keep reading. In four pages in the middle of the book, he gives very stock arguments for the deity of Christ without really making clear what he means by that. He leans very heavily on the gospel according to John. He gives us a very common misreading of John 10.30, where Jesus says, the Father and I are one. If you just look at the context there, I think you'll see what he means by one. He very quickly proof texts his way to the points that, in his words, the Holy Spirit is divine in the same sense that the Father and the Son are divine. And then he gestures at the two most famous triadic passages, which mention the three of them in close succession. That's in Matthew 28 and then in 2 Corinthians 13. Okay, but what's going on? He moves on then to argue that all three of them have all of the essential divine attributes. This is really very lamely argued, in my opinion. A lot of the texts he cite just don't say what he means them to say, what he intends them to say. And he ignores all rival interpretations, whether by Trinitarians or by Unitarians. So, too quick. All right, but fine. What is the Trinity? Maybe this is provable from the scriptures. Maybe it's not. But what is it? This you finally get on page 23. And again, on page 25, it's pretty clearly what I call a three-self trinity. So it's really contrary to what Dr. Sproul was saying. The trinity isn't one self with three personalities. Rather, these are three selves. They're three personal beings. In some sense, they're to be considered one being, like maybe they're parts of one being, although he doesn't quite say that. He characterizes them as three centers of self-consciousness which is unclear by itself. Then he goes on to say that each one is an intelligent subject who can say, I, their selves. So the Trinity is three beings, each of which is fully divine in the same sense, three distinct beings. Well, that's just tritheism, right? That's just belief in three gods. What's he going to say to this? Well, he doesn't tell you right away. First, he decides to tell you about Arius and how that led to the Nicene Creed. On the positive side, at least he mentions Arius. On the negative side, he badly mischaracterizes Arius. He says that Arius was attacking the divinity of Christ and therefore the Trinity as well. Well, that's an anachronism. There wasn't a doctrine of the tripersonal God at this time to attack. This is something that's recognized in all the histories that are careful in their coverage of this. He says Arius believed in degrees of divinity. That's true, although a lot of earlier mainstream people did, like Origen and Tertullian. He says Arius wrongly thought that God had to have an intermediary to interact with the world. Yeah, but that's what the earlier people thought as well. He diagnoses that Arius was a victim of a pagan way of thinking. The best scholarly treatments of Arius don't say this nowadays. It says the so-called Arians were making alliances with the spirit of paganism as well as with the Jews. Mm, Not really. I mean, this was really very much an internal fight among mainstream, small-c Catholic Christians. A lot of them lined up on the side of Arius. For instance, the very famous church historian Eusebius of Caesarea was on that side. But a lot of bishops were. A lot of Christians were. Uh, especially people who were followers of origin, were taking the subordinationist side. He does make clear to his credit that in 325, the bishops came with a new non-scriptural word, homoousios, to describe the Father and the eternal Logos. And he expounds this as saying that they share the same divine being, that they are God in exactly the same way. Well, wait a second, so... They're the same God, or they're parts of God, or they're just two equal gods? Which is it exactly? He really doesn't pause to wonder what this key term could have meant to them at that time. 
In my chapter on this called Substance Abuse, I go through nine different things that it might mean to say that the Father and the Logos are one usia, and I whittle them down. I eliminate some of the possibilities, and I make my suggestions about what I think was meant by that claim in 325, and then something I argue a little different was meant by that claim in 381. Okay, Dr. Wells, but what about tritheism? Tritheism is no good, right? Here's how he answers the concern about tritheism. We in the West are not seduced today by the thought of multiple deities or of creations before creation or of a son who is divine but not in the same sense as the Father. Aside from the Jehovah's Witnesses, this kind of speculation has disappeared. People either believe in the divinity of Christ or they do not. What we are susceptible to is a little different. It is the allure of modalism, which is the other heresy being addressed in this creed. It is the habit of speaking of the Trinity as simply the three ways in which God presents himself to us. Well, it's not clear that that's really how modalism is to be understood. That is how some theologians define it. Okay, but what is the answer that's been given? The answer that's been given is... Out of the two extremes, modalism and tritheism, our culture prevents us from becoming tritheists or polytheists. So let's just lean toward that side because that won't be a danger for us. The danger for us is modalism. But look, this, this is not clear. You can still find plenty of Christians who think that God created Jesus, that the Father created the Son, or that the Father caused the Son to exist or is older than the Son and things like this. It's really not just the Jehovah's Witnesses who speculate in that way. Never mind our culture. I mean, isn't it just false that there are three equal deities? Isn't tritheism false? And look, it's just not problematic for an American in the 21st century to be a tritheist. There's one little denomination somewhere that says that there are two in the God family, the Father and the Son, and so they're ditheists. There are contemporaries. They have the same culture that we do. Okay, so it looks like he's just serving up tritheism, but then he muddies the water on page 32. He talks about not only the Father and the Son and the Spirit as divine persons, but he continues to talk about God as a he. And this makes it sound like God, the Trinity, is a fourth divine person. So, what's going on? Nobody wants four divine persons, right? Dr. Sproul has one divine person, one divine self. Dr. Wells has three divine selves. But then he seems to imply a fourth divine self, which again is the Trinity. But he doesn't get into that objection. He ends by giving some practical implications, trying to show that Trinity is a useful and important doctrine, important for our spiritual lives. And one application, he says, is to prayer. He says... And prayer, like the gospel, is shaped by the reality of God as triune. We pray to the Father through Christ our mediator by the Holy Spirit. That is the basic New Testament pattern. Right, that is the basic New Testament pattern, but why think that's a Trinitarian pattern? If you think the one God is the Trinity, shouldn't you pray to the Trinity? If you think that the Father, Son, and Spirit are three co-equal, perfectly equal, equally divine persons, shouldn't you pray to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit? Why should you pray to the Father as opposed to the other two? Why should you pray through the Son and not to the Son just as much as you pray to the Father? I don't know, this sounds kind of unitarian to me. How is this an application of his three-self trinity doctrine? It's not clear that it is. In sum, it's a better production than Dr. Sproul's book, but it's not very carefully argued. It's very one-sided. It ignores a lot of obvious objections to its own view, which it pushes. And it seems that in the end, Dr. Wells is just hoping that you don't notice that other Trinitarians are saying different things. Some don't think that there are three selves in the Trinity. Some, like Dr. Sproul, think that there's one self there. Also, some really refuse to say what God is three of. Dr. Sproul kind of has it both ways. 
he seems to say that God is one self, but then he says, well, you don't know what these three things really are. You really can't say what this distinction amounts to. Okay, but Dr. Wells definitely thinks that there are three selves here, indeed three beings, and each of these beings is divine in the same way that God is divine. So he just doesn't lift a finger to show that this isn't tritheism. He just asserts that we're immune from that error just by being, I guess, 21st century Western people or maybe North Americans. It's hard to see how that's so. When the Trinity's podcast returns, my book, What is the Trinity? I'll be very brief and give a quick overview of my book, What is the Trinity? My book is trying to do a lot less than these other two books are trying to do. The books by Dr. Sproul and Dr. Wells are trying to prove the Trinity from the Bible. They're trying to give you a history of these doctrinal formulations, which they do not do well. And then they try to clarify what, in their view, the Trinity is. And, well, they don't get very far. My book is less ambitious. My book doesn't really argue for my view about the Trinity. It doesn't even really fully explain it. It doesn't hide what my views are, but it doesn't lead with them. And the reason for that is I'm trying to be helpful to you. I want to help you see fit to make certain distinctions, and I want to put in your hands certain accurate historical information that will empower you to settle these questions for yourselves. So yeah, I'll tell you what I think very briefly in the book, and I talk about it more in other articles and other writings and in a bigger forthcoming book that I'm still trying to finish. But this book isn't about me. It's about, can we gain some clarity on this subject? My first chapter is called, Don't Be Afraid to Think About God. And it tries to get rid of some of the fear that keeps people from pursuing this subject. We're supposed to love God with our minds, God says that he will guide us. Most Christians think that in some sense, Scripture is sufficient to guide our thoughts about God. So, look, we shouldn't be afraid about this. It's just mistaken to think that God is hiding behind the door with a baseball bat and he's going to nail you if you make one little mistake. Isn't he a generous father that wants to help us take baby steps and maybe even learn how to walk? Second chapter, I distinguish formulas from interpretations. And that's the interesting thing about the Trinity, and it's a frustrating thing. What was settled by the ancient Catholic tradition in these ecumenical creeds was some standard language about God, the Spirit of God, and the Son of God. And the language doesn't really interpret itself. You have to interpret it. And in fact, different theologians interpret it differently. And so when people talk about the Trinity, they don't mean some one thing. We have to make some inquiries to find out what a person actually thinks. If they just nod their head and say, yeah, I believe in the Trinity. I agree that God is three persons in one substance. By itself, that agreement just tells us that they like the majority tradition. They approve of the majority language. But it doesn't really tell us what they think about this topic. So we have to push on. In chapter three, I distinguish the earlier use of the term Trinity from the later use The earlier use just has it being a plural referring term, and you see this in the late second century. It just refers to these three, God, God's Logos, and God's Spirit, without presupposing that they're equal or that they're within one being or anything like that. It's just a triad. It's just a threesome, you could say. Later on, after the 381 Council especially, people use the Trinity to mean the Father, Son, and Spirit, understood to be altogether one God. In some sense, now it's a distinction within the one God. In the earlier usage, God is a member of the Trinity. In the later usage, God is the Trinity. And so I call the first, the triad term, 
Trinity with a small T in the later term, Trinity with a capital T, like some translators do of ancient theological works. Some of them do this so as not to import the later idea of a tripersonal God into people like Tertullian or Origen or Irenaeus or Justin Martyr. Chapter 4 is called The Deity of Christ versus the Trinity. It just says, look, these are two different claims. The Deity of Christ claim comes well before the Trinity claim in church history. And let's just be clear about which one we're going to talk about. Of course, they are related claims. The Trinity presupposes the Deity of Christ. Five is called Get a Date. And it's about when we actually see belief in a tripersonal God, in some sense consisting of three equally divine persons or hypostases. I tell the story about how this official view came to triumph, and I describe how it was really language rather than theology which was enforced. And so then and now, people are wondering, well, what are these three persons supposed to be? What does it mean to say these persons are one usia or one substance? So in chapters 6 and 7, I kind of survey the options there. I explain what different Trinitarians mean by talking about the persons of the Trinity, whether they're supposed to be selves or just like ways that God exists or personalities or something we know not what. In the substance chapter, I go through nine different interpretations and then offer my best guess about what was meant in 325 and then what was meant in 381. And this is all to invite you to ask, well, what should I think about this? What do I make of these traditional confessions? Do I agree with them? How shall I understand them? Chapter 8 is called Mystery Mountain. It's about what it means to say the Trinity is a mystery. People mean quite different things by that. Sometimes they're saying something really that no Christian would disagree with. And sometimes they're saying something very controversial, such as that the Trinity is apparently contradictory, and there's no way we can get around that. Like, it's just going to seem like a contradiction to us no matter what we do. Really? Well, some agree with that. Some disagree with that. I discuss these different issues. Sometimes when people say the Trinity is a mystery, they mean just that they don't know what it means. That seems to be problematic. In chapter 9, I ask the question, what, according to Christianity, is God supposed to be? How are we supposed to think of this being? Is God an it, a he, or a they? Or do we just draw a blank when we try to think about this being? There are different views about this in Christian theology. If the one God is the Trinity and the one God is a self, well, then the Trinity has got to be a self. If the one God is a who-knows-what then the Trinity as a whole has got to be a who-knows-what. Some people nowadays think that God is a group, like God is very similar to a family or a circle of three friends that eternally dance together in equal bliss. I talk about these views and how they relate to Scripture and some objections that Trinitarians particularly give to one another on these topics. Chapter 10 is called says who, and that raises the issue of what is the fundamental authority for a Christian's theology? Are the books of the Bible our fundamental authority, or is the universal church our fundamental authority? And Catholics and Protestants are going to approach this issue of the Trinity in some different ways, and I explain how that matters for this, and I kind of invite you to make your choice Are you going to go with the authority of fourth century bishops and say, well, these people gave us the Bible, so their authority is more fundamental than the authority of the Bible? Or are you going to go the Protestant way and say, yeah, you know, we really have to base ourselves on the writings of the apostles and really through them on Jesus. We have to agree with their theology. And whenever later traditions contradict those earlier ones, well, we're going to have to go with the earlier ones. So, Are you going to go with the Protestant back-to-the-sources idea or not? In the epilogue to the book, I come back to the question, well, what about the two natures of Christ? What about that doctrine? What shall we say about that? That's kind of a different topic, and I don't go into all the ins and outs of it in this book, but I give you what I think are some really deep and helpful and accurate sources so that you can sort it out 
when you have time to look into that. So that's my own little self book review on what is the Trinity. I hope the book is adequate in some ways that these other two are not. As I explained, it's a less ambitious book, and it might leave you a little bit unsatisfied, but I hope it leaves you feeling less confused and more able to make up your mind about how to understand the one God, especially according to the Bible. You can get my book in paperback at Amazon.com. You can get it in ebook, probably anywhere that you buy ebooks. And hopefully soon there'll be an unabridged audio book version, which will also be on Amazon. Also, my friend Sean Finnegan, who hosts the excellent Restitutio podcast, interviewed me about my book. If you'd like to hear that, I'll put a link for that on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org. I'll also post a link to the book's own website, which has more information about it and has some links to where you can buy it. That is whatisthetrinity.com, except you have to put a dash between the words. So what-the-trinity.com. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to love God with all of your strength and all of your mind. This week's thinking music has been the track Brooks by Kai Engel. If you love the Trinity's podcast, please share the podcast on social media. Help us to get the word out on Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, and so on. Another thing you can do is give us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country. For some directions on how to do this, just go to trinities.org slash blog slash review. You can support the podcast by giving us a one-time or a monthly donation through PayPal. Just look for the orange buttons on the right side of any blog post. Every little bit helps. And if you shop at Amazon.com, enter that website through a blog post. If you do this and then make a purchase, then without increasing your price, we get a small percentage. Lastly, make your voice heard. Give us a comment on the blog post for this episode. Or join our very active Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash trinities. We're always open to show ideas, guest suggestions, objections, and so on. Sometimes I even respond to feedback in an episode. Don't forget then to share, to rate, to chip in when you can, and to talk back. For listening, we'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.